we have a chira growing here. Those are the big leaves with a little color to them. It's basically a shelf of subsoil clay that has a little bit of topsoil on top. And I just placed the bulbs just a little bit into the subsoil and then covered it up with a lot of straw. They're growing. You see critters are eating on them. But they're growing. I grew them up here last year too in different spots and the deer ate them all. So the deer haven't been up here too much. That's interesting. Got the Phragmites here. And what I read was if you cut in late July or early August, that's the best time because they've sent energy from the roots to the stems. And of course they're going to begin seed production. So now you've taken that energy and laid it on the ground. And then they won't send uh, energy back to the roots as they die off for the winter. So the roots are weakened. I cut this access road with that machine. It's basically a small motor. I think it's a horse and a half motor with a long pole and at the end of the pole there's a sickle blade. And that's what I used to cut Phragmites and then I cut there's a, there's mostly um, goldenrod growing in here. Some of this rushes. Rushes really shouldn't grow here too much but we've had so much rain the last couple of years they're just spreading around all over. And the reason why I cut it is because I put some seed in here. First I seeded it and it was a combination of uh, winter rye and rape, chicory, turnip, radish. I think that's it. It was a combination of those things. And then I cut it and that vibration of the sickle blade definitely you know, shook the seeds down to the ground level. And then I laid this stuff over the top so that I'll kind of protect it from birds. And hopefully it rains. It was supposed to rain last night and it didn't. But if it doesn't rain, this will provide some, some cover. So uh, hopefully it's preserved. The seed it stays there until, it's, until it does rain. And there's my trail camera I've been getting some pretty good shots of bobcats and coyotes deer this is a bear proof apiary that I had started with it with the excavator it's not something well I thought maybe I'd have her going by now because it's been like three four years now since I built it but uh, somewhere down the line I'll get her done the excavator was here and it didn't take long to pop those things in there all I gotta do is finish it by putting those cattle panels up around and you gotta actually have a roof too because the bear will climb up over the top. Someday, well, this is the mound below the circle swale and I planted black walnuts all along. This, um, this would be the uh, north to south east or west side of the mound. <laughs> See what am I talking about? Here are the oldest ones. These are probably planted fall of 2013. When I counted, there was more than 25 in here now. I kind of extended the uh, planting into the more southern regions of the circle swale. If I put the camera up, you can see the swale. It's a circle swell. It's 185 feet in diameter, or approximately, because I just paced it off. I planted some Chinese dogwood up here. They grow a, kind of a cherry. It's not sweet. I've never tasted one. I don't know if the texture is anything special. 
but it produces a crop and it's a dogwood dogwoods like to grow here so uh, planted quite a few of them and there's at least a dozen that are growing real well just like this one I don't know what plant that is growing up with it with the flowers hmm. something that just showed up I also dug a couple of ponds that were tucked in here into the trees yeah, and this is on the uh, east opening. East, so these are, these trees are to the west of this little pond. And the reason why I did that is if there's serious drought, I was hoping that this would hold water, keep something going for the frogs. And I got another one that's a lot deeper than this, even just in case there's prolonged drought. I got a black topelo growing right there. It's pretty neat. Some willows. And cornelian cherries, which is another dogwood. And planted quite a few. There's probably a dozen here. That's the one that's growing probably the best. There's a series of mounds right here. And I scraped the topsoil off over there to dig some ponds and I got a little bit of it dug but they're not finished. But this is topsoil from that situation and I've got all types of trees growing on here. You know wild plums and crab apples, a couple of mulberries. I planted a couple of like ten golden rain trees in here and I think there's only one that's living and it had died back. Um, I'm going to be putting some honey locusts in here that I've grafted with Hershey um, shoots. Hershey honey locusts. Hmm, what else do I have in here? I think that's basically it. I want it to be kind of a succession from plums and crab apples into honey locusts and Chinese dogwood, Chinese or um, cornelian cherries. I got the cornelian cherries on the sun side here, and I'll put the um, honey locusts towards the north side, towards the shade side, because they'll grow taller. Oh, I also have Korean nut pines in here. Yeah, and there's a butter heart in there and I'm trying to plant another one. I planted two of them now as uh, companions to the one that is growing and both of those two died so it's alone again. Then there's a few trees here that I didn't cut or didn't have them remove them when we built these uh, mounds. I think that's some type of a spruce. I don't know. And there's a tamarack there. White birch. A couple of balsam firs I have grown yet. Some of the poplars, I actually uh, coppiced them. So there's stuff that is growing here. There's a little, like a guild here, right here I'm standing next to. I got a black locust in here, and there's white birch, there's some poplars, balsam fir. I planted a kiwi in there, Turkish hazelnut. So uh, I plan to uh, coppice this poplar in the front. Balsam fir, I might let that continue to grow because it's providing some shade for the ground. And the white birch, I'll just let that grow. The kiwi keeps getting ate back by deer every year, but it keeps living. So I don't know what's going to happen. The Turkish hazelnut, you know, that's a bird and a squirrel and a and a deer planting. They're just small nuts. But it got ate back by the deer a couple of years too. There it is. It's growing. Not very fast. It's in the shade so it'll take time. That's okay. Yeah, there's a Korean nut pine here too. This little guild with a nice rock. Right there it is. It's doing very well. It's one of the better ones. It's probably connected to the network, underground network in this little guild already. 
so I don't know what that is. Looks like one of those plums, maybe. This is an area that's right off of a swale. That's the swale. This is the swale mound. And there's a little, little trench kind of like right there. Actually, it's not a trench. What we did was originally when I had uh, clear cut this spot, you know, I mean, I wasn't that smart in terms of soil and whatnot. And what we did was clear cut it, and then I had a bulldozer come in here and bulldoze all the stumps down into a pile. Down a little bit down past those trees right there. And it sat there for years. That was back in, I don't know, 20. 2005 or something so that pile of stumps sat there for until 2014 so maybe 10 years and it all rotted down there wasn't much wood left in there because you know we all the topsoil went with it so then I had the excavator come in here and he piled it into three different spots this is one of them so this was the clay subsoil and then this would be probably about a foot, foot thick of that material that decomposed the topsoil and the wood. So that was like a hugel culture there. So this hugel culture material was replaced back up here and I planted um, a wetland grass mix seed in here and some bird's foot trefoil and now it's gone to mostly goldenrod and canary grass. So I want to establish a hazelnut and some other bushes, you know, like maybe some elderberries, just all wildlife stuff in here, but I don't want it to be trees. I want it to be lower growing bushes and something that a deer browse. Birds will eat. Yeah, you know, bears maybe, whatever. You know, smorgasbord or something. So I probably do some some you know, maybe a Cornelian cherry in here, some other things like that too. Oh, maybe a mulberry. Gotta have some mulberries. Well, I got mulberries right behind me. So mulberries are here. Mulberries are good for birds. I planted red ones and black ones up here. And uh, I planted maybe a hundred of them and I got, you know, three or four growing. But anyhow, I cut this with the, with that sickle machine a couple of weeks ago. Well, yesterday when I came up, I seeded it and then cut it again. It was supposed to rain last night, but it, it hasn't rained yet. And I'm not too worried that sickle machine vibrated all these plants that I cut, and I'm sure all the seeds are down, you know, really close, if not on the ground, right close next to the ground. So if the first rain comes along, they're going to germinate. They'll, their roots will find it, and they're going to come up. And I might have to cut this one more time yet. I'll cut it maybe September 1st just to keep the canary grass from uh, sending up new, new uh, leaves and give the seeding that I had a chance to grow. And then I got another one similar situation above. This is the top one. And I actually made a uh, rail fence here and the rail fence's purpose is to hold up this welded wire. I got an experiment going where I had uh, just a five-sided rail fence covered with wire like this and I put some real succulent plants inside of it seeing if the deer would jump in and they, they haven't. So we're kind of following that same principle here. I got one that's narrower. It's going to be harder for them to jump in. And I didn't have enough fence to cover the whole thing. That's why it's cut short here. I'll bring some more next time I come up. And then I've got one over here. Here's the swale, by the way. This is the uppermost swale. This was a little steeper and smaller swale I dug just to see. It'll make some differences. And this one is wider. Will they jump into that? This is only a five foot fence. They can jump over that. But I did put a couple of uh, cedar poles in here to make it a little complicated inside for them to jump into at this little wider spot. Just something they gotta think about so maybe they won't jump. But I did the same thing 
on this upper one is the lower one. I seated it and cut it again. Except for this little spot here, I didn't recut it because there's a hornet's nest right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a hornet's nest. It's a different kind of a hornet. They're kind of shorter, blacker. But here we had this gooder bring all that material up here too. So this is all part of that hula culture. And that's how I'm going to establish the hazelnuts, by the way. I'm going to plant them inside of these cages so that the deer don't eat them when they're first growing. I got more to build. I want to do the entire bottom or top one here first. So I'm going to make more rails this winter and extend this out, put more caging in here. And the primary is going to be the hazelnuts. And secondary, I'll do the elderberries. And they grow a little bit taller, so they'll be on the shade side of the hazelnuts. And I'll probably add a couple other bushes in here. Oh, one thing I want to add is hascaps. So maybe in the very front, front or the sun side. Actually, the hascaps don't like a lot of sun in the summer, so I'll plant them on the east side so they get morning sun, but afternoon shade. That's where I'll put the hascaps. And I know the deer like to browse them, so uh, that works for up here. It's an early uh, nectar source for bees, and it's an early berry for birds. That'd, that'd be a good one. So that's what I've been doing coming up here the last couple times. Getting this all prepared. I'm uh, growing hazelnuts in my backyard. And I'm going to plant them in a nurse bed in my backyard uh, next, next spring. So this is probably going to be uh, two or three years down the road before I plant them up here. Let them get to be a couple feet high. And all that time I'll be cutting on this stuff and reducing the vigor of the canary grass and the golden rods. And I'm planting, oh, there's also clover mixing that seed, else like clover. So these seeds that I'm planting in here will be adding to the fertility for the hazelnuts. So here's the, here's the second soil. It's shallower and wider. And this was clay subsoil that I put on here and I planted a bunch of trees and most of the trees died because it was just subsoil. But now that the bird's foot trefoil I planted on it, I planted that on here right away, that was 2013. You can see this is later flower, later blossom. But that, that uh, bird's foot has loosened this clay soil up really nice. And now you can see even the goldenrod likes it and there's ferns that are growing on here and I planted some comfrey in here now. And it's getting to be quite lush compared to what it was in the beginning. And I think it's all because that bird's foot was, was working it over and, add, and fixing nitrogen. So now I started planting some trees again. I've got, uh, I planted some, it's a rootstock for, for, for plums. And it died back, but it's coming out of the roots. Got four or five of them on here now, and they all grew. They all made it through the winter, and they're growing. That's pretty cool. This is a really big hugo culture here. It's, we actually buried some live wood in there that I just cut down. And here we got the mulberries. This is a black locust. Look at that. This is the biggest black locust on the property. That's huge. Huge it grew. It loves this hugo culture. And there's aronia in here and crab apple. There's Antonovka. There's some a couple of hazelnuts growing in here. Here's one that the deer keep cropping off. I'll have to, I'll have to cage it. I don't know what the hell I have in here. Probably have one of those plums in here, I'm sure. But I planted like 30 trees on this little mound and there's like maybe a dozen growing. That aronia there is really growing nice. 
and the berries are pretty sweet. If you wait a couple of frosts and it start and the berries actually start to shrivel a little bit, that stringency goes right away and it actually kind of a little bit of sweetness to it. Okay, I got a hop hornbeam branch in my hand. I'm pulling it down and I got mosquitoes after me too. You can see there's a it's reproducing here. Those are seeds. I think they're nuts. Another one right there. So this is a a tree that I had left here. We I had clear cut the poplar years ago. That would be like 1999, and I left this little scraggly thing grow because it was something different. And it's rep reproducing. It's got little babies all over the place here now. And I think you can eat these. Let's see if I can hold this branch and pluck one of these off of here. Let's see what it is. Yeah, there's something in there. I don't know if they would, if this is called it would be called a nut or a seed. Oops, I dropped it. <laughs> that one was definitely browner. Here's one that's brown. And that's more like a seed. If there's a bigger one in there, where did it go now? I don't know where it went. Oh, there it is. That one feels bigger. Freaking mosquitoes. So I just put it in my mouth, we'll see if I can eat, eat something of it. You can see all these, you always get this kind of, this leaf that gets eaten up, gets browned. These are all babies from this ironwood tree. This one here's got uh, those same seeds to it. Way up on top, you gotta look. You can see some seeds on this one too. That would be second generation from this tree here. There's really not much in that seed, but it's got some flavor. <laughs> Here's another tree that I left when I clear cut. It's a beech. And it has grown very well. And there's little beaches growing around, so I know it's been having some nuts. And now I have proof positive because look, it's got nuts. I actually picked one and ate one yesterday. It was pretty good. I liked it. So I'll pick another one. I don't think they're quite ripe yet. But uh, okay, I opened it up. And it kind of just pops out of that little shell it's in. I never did this before until yesterday. Yeah, it popped out of there. There it is. That's what I ate. I don't think you're quite right, but they're still edible. They actually have a nice after flavor to them. I enjoyed it. Hopefully I remember next time I come to look at them again. But this tree's weird. It spirals. Uh, before all these branches were 
getting thick you can't see through it you can see that the bark just spiraled all the way up the tree the earth is spinning trees are brown and trees spiral along with the spinning well, maybe the spiral comes from the earth spiraling around the sun as the solar system is moving through space and I can see nuts on most of these branches too. All the way up. It's pretty good. Here's one of the trees I planted in year 2000. I probably planted a thousand trees in a couple of years there. And there's like eight of them that are 11. But uh, it, it's this has made um, acorns a couple times. But I never got a chance to get one that was fully ripe now most of the time it's just makes these little ones and then they end up falling off but last year there were a couple that were really huge not very many but they're monsters well now these I don't think these are gonna grow into big monster acorns so I don't know I don't understand that and I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens and this grew pretty good it's probably seven inches in diameter Sap suckers are really putting a lot of holes in it and it just keeps right on living. That thing's at least 20 feet tall now. It likes it here. These Cornelian cherries. A couple weeks ago where I picked all the cherries and ate them and saved the pits. I'll replant them up here. I think I'll start them in a nurse, or nurse bed in my backyard first. Then I'll bring them back. So that'll be uh, Nanking cherries where the seed was raised on the on the property here. It'll be second generation. This first generation is it likes they, they like this spot. They're growing pretty nice. They had a decent crop of cherries. Two of them did. The third one, the one in the center didn't have any. But uh you know, these weren't raised here. They were planted here, raised somewhere else. But the seeds will be raised here and then the seeds from those seeds will be that that third generation that'll be actually stock that came from this land so that's what I'm interested in that third generation and those you know the seeds or the cherries that, are, that grow off of the second generation those are the ones I'm really going to cherish and replant a lot of I'll put that all over the place here's some more canary grass I cut down just to slow it down a little bit I've got a sea berry establishment here with uh, hazelnuts and Antonovka apples between them. So not all the sea berries lived on the on the lesser side of this uh, hugu culture material, but the ones on the rich side, oh, they are growing very well. I'm gonna do a little grafting next spring. So some of these berries are very small, very tart. I'm definitely going to graft those. I've got a lot of males here. I'm going to graft some of the males. Then some of them I'm going to allow to grow. This one here ripens very early. So this one's ripe weeks before the rest of them on this one. And this one here has maybe the biggest berries of, them, of all of them. And they've got a little bit of sweetness to it. It's not terrible. It's not really tart like this one over here that ripens really early. Then I have one that uh, doesn't have any thorns and the berries taste like tangerine. So that one I actually took some cyan wood off of and grafted on sea berries I've grown in my backyard. We'll see how that works out. It's got like a little corridor coming through here with the access path. That's really nice. And I established hazelnuts on both sides next to the sea berries. So those hazelnuts should really grow well with the nitrogen that the sea berries fix. We'll see. Here's the Mollison tree that I established in honor of Bill Mollison. It's really liking it here. <laughs> it's growing pretty tall. Lots of leaves. Lush. So every winter I've been putting a tube around it, 
keep the mice from eating on it, so I'll do that again. In the summer, I take it off. This is located at the southwest corner of the camp, and along with this black locust or black uh, walnut, it'll shade the camp from the hot afternoon sun, and they'll both provide a crop. Before, and that grasshopper jumped and landed in the spider's web. And now the spider is going to eat. And I walked away, the spider had jumped on him already. And uh, started wrapping it up. But look at that weave that it made in its web. Strengthen the web. That's cool. That is an event playing out on a wild land. Different I haven't seen before. This willow tree is growing something. Kind of looks like a little pine cone almost. Never seen that before. Look at that. And you can focus here. Look at that. Weird. We'll have to watch that, see what comes out of them. Well, maybe we'll just pick one of them and see what one looks like. It's the ripest. That one there looks pretty ripe back there. Let's pick that and see what's in it. There's like little bitty seeds, I think, coming out of there. Mm. <laughs> There's something right there. That might be a seed right in there. Interesting. 